Blog Talk Radio. and think about the message that uh, 
Mark Lester put into the film and you look at how schools became in the mid to late 90s till today, you'll see a lot of similarities. Granted, not quite to the extreme, but it, it, it certainly shows that back then people saw where society was heading and how things were heading in our school systems. Uh, it's a very beautiful package put together all by Screen Factory, so we will be reviewing that around the 9.40, 9.45 hour. We will also be reviewing Olive Films' Blu-ray release of Night of the Scarecrow, and here's another one. This is one that I have not seen since it came out on video back in uh, 95, 96. Um, pretty fun film to watch, to be perfectly honest with you. This was during the early advent days of CGI, so there there are a few bits of computer work in this early film, but I really don't feel like they detract from the film at all. Uh, there's some excellent murder set pieces in this. I thought the film was capably acted, and we will, of course, go into much, much more detail about that film here in a few moments. In our Metal Blade Spotlight tonight, we are going to hear the new C, uh, some songs from a band called Apophis. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, a little bit of background in from uh, on them. A word derived from Apophis, the near-Earth asteroid that caused a brief period of concern because initial observations indicated a probability that it would hit Earth on April 13, 2029, a collision of immeasurable proportions. Um, they're a Netherlands-based death metal act. Um, band members of renowned Dutch bands include God Dethroned, Prostitute Disfigurement, Detonation, and Toxocara. The band formed in 2012 and have since been surgically carving their path in the modern death metal scene. They prioritize song structure above technicality and strive to become part of the new standard in death metal. Response from fans to the 2013 demo material was completely overwhelming, and with expectations quite high already for this young band, they sit poised to finally release their debut full-length worldwide on Metal Blade Records. Prime Incursion will take you on an epic venture across the known universe and beyond, with themes ranging from transcendental travel, rapid evolutionary progression, and global epidemics, to artificial intelligence in an all-out war with their maker. All inspired by modern art, media, and science, Prime Incursion includes or contains nine songs of furious sci-fi tinged death metal. The album was mixed by Kevin Culligan and mastered by Stefano Morbito at 16th Cellar Studios, uh, also famous for Flesh God, Apocalypse, and House of Penance. The band consists of Kevin Quiglin on vocals, uh, San Von Dijk on guitars, Cohen Romijn on guitars, uh, Michael Vanderplitch on drums, and Michael Sherman on bass. So, without further ado, let's go into our first me uh, Metal Blade Spotlight song. The name of the band is Apophis. The name of the CD is Prime Incursion. The song is The Antidote. Tell you about your God's plan. Six billion people on Earth when the infection hit. KV had a 90% kill rate. That's 5.4 billion people dead, crashed, bled out, dead. Less a 1% immune. Left 12 million healthy people like you, me, and Ethan. The other 588 million turned into your dark seekers, and then they got hungry. And they killed and fed on everybody. Everybody. Every single person that you or I has ever known is dead. <laughs> I'm gonna be a bit of a loser. 
you know, you're talking about 1995, you're talking mid-90s, you're talking about when CGI and things first started happening uh, in horror films, and this is one of those films that I can fondly look back on and say that the CG was not overdone. Now, of course, by today's standards, they are kind of crude effects in a sense, if if you want to use that word to describe them, but overall, I think it really ha- helped add to the element of the film. Now, what you're what you're looking at here is um, <clears throat> you have a town, and in the beginning of the movie, uh, you see the mayor and all the townsfolks there, and the mayor is very excited about uh, some construction that's going to be going on. And what you've got is uh, the mayor's daughter, who's played by Elizabeth uh, Barandes. I hope I pronounced that right. Claire's her name. Um, and she meets up with uh, John Meese in the beginning of the film. Um, you know, and she winds up inviting him over to dinner. And, you know, you see that the father and the daughter are a little estranged. But uh, the majority of her family holds important positions in the town. Of course, the mayor, the sheriff, things like that. So there's a young man who a little bit of an upstart gets into with, uh, with the guy that Claire is talking to, and he and another friend take a uh, uh, kind of like a tractor out into the field, and they accidentally run over a grating in front of a scarecrow, and it cracks. And, you know, there's there's a high wind, there's a little bit of mystery about what's going on with all that. Well, later on, there's a, a, a bright flash, almost like lightning comes out, and it strikes the scarecrow, and it basically reanimates the scarecrow, and the scarecrow goes on and starts doing a bunch of killing. Uh, there are some really great murder sequences in this as the townsfolks are, are basically knocked off one by one. Her uncle is uh, pinned to the wall in his barn and is basically run into and and just flayed by a, a wheat thresher. Uh, that's a pretty good sequence. Not necessarily overly gory or anything like that, but the setup and the camera angles for it were, were really well done. Uh, you have the town preacher's daughter who turns out to be kind of a, a little bit of a dirty girl and she's dating the uh the guy that gave Claire's new friend some trouble and they go out uh into a field to have a little bit of fun and as the guy goes out to get some beer the scarecrow appears in the van and uh for lack of a better term and plants his seed into the preacher's daughter and uh very similar to evil dead you know Vines and sprouts come out and, you know, rip through her and drag her out of the truck, and then he is dispatched of as well. And he starts going through the town. He uh, he uh, traps the priest in uh, in the town church and, and sews his mouth shut, and the priest escapes later on to run into Claire and, and her friend. And uh, he tells the backstory of a wizard who used to live in the town, a warlock. And uh, he was very hedonistic, orgies and things like that with the with the women of the town. And the townsfolk decide that they have had enough of him, and they drug him and they take him out to the field and they uh, they basically crucify him as a scarecrow in the field, and he dies. Well, when he dies, they bury his bones underground in a small little casket in front of this scarecrow. And they basically use the black magic rituals that are contained in one of the warlock's book. So basically the town forefathers, you know, to be a profitable town, have, have used black magic against this warlock. Well, now he's escaped and he's looking for the book. And he's systematically going through the town, offing people. Uh, you know, the film is not a comedy, but in a sense, the scarecrow goes around a lot and says a lot of funny, you know, there's a, there's a few interesting lines from him, you know, like take my seed and things like that. Um there's a variety of, of methods he uses to kill people. One of my favorites in particular in this film is when the town's mayor is trapped by the scarecrow. And the scarecrow basically pins him up to the wall with a sword and a fireplace poker and inserts a piece of straw into his arm. And the straw goes up 
and a straw starts coming out his eyeballs and out his nose and out his mouth until his his body is basically covered. Um, it was pretty gruesome. I, I really liked the ways that that looked. Um, you know, as the film goes on, more and more towns people um, get off. Claire and her uh, boyfriend find the book upstairs in her dad's house, and they're running to different locations. And as it turns out, the only way to stop the scarecrow is to burn the remains that are left in the coffin. Whatever happens to the remains happens to the scarecrow. So after the police are dispatched, it's just the two of them, and they they get to the bones, and they're initially going to pour um, an acid substance on it, but the scarecrow stops them. And they eventually make it to uh, a tool shed, and they blow up the tool shed thinking that it's over, but it doesn't destroy the bones. The scarecrow beats the hell out of the boyfriend, ties up Claire, and as he's about to do the same thing to her that he did to the girl in the van, the boyfriend takes the casket, and there's uh, uh, kind of like a tractor with a giant weight press on it. And he sets the casket underneath it, and he drops the weight on it, crushing the bones in the, in the coffin which results in the scarecrow exploding and dying. So apparently everything is okay from there. I thought the film was capably acted. I really enjoyed a lot of the effects. I really didn't feel like uh, the CGI ruined the film at all. In fact, this is one of those rare occasions, especially for the early to mid-90s, where I thought the, the CGI really helped to enhance the film in a lot of ways. As far as special features goes, especially for an Olive Films release, this has a few more. This has a making of featurette that is interviews with the cast and crew that runs about three minutes. This came off of the original VHS release. There's a stills gallery with music and commentary from director Jeff Burr. That's nice. Um, that runs about eight minutes. Jeff talks about, and I think it's funny that he mentions it, you know, everything was on paper. Nowadays, everything would have been done digitally. He also talks about how there's um, – this was the last film that he worked on that actually had a movie poster, well, one sheet made for it. I found that to be interesting. And he also talks about how the cover art was different for the release than it was for the poster. And then there's the feature-length audio commentary with director Jeff Burr. I think the packaging was absolutely beautiful. Um, it's a little bit more of a close-up of the VHS release. Um Again, I thought the picture looked good. I thought it sounded good. Uh, I'm glad that they included a little bit more special features on this. I would give the overall rating of the disc uh, a 7 out of 10. I would give the movie um, a 3 out of 5 stars. It's definitely entertaining. It's one that you can sit down with your friends, have a few beers, and enjoy it. Make sure to head on over to olivefilms.com to pick up your copy. You may be able to find this in your local big box retailer. You should also be able to find it on amazon.com. I'm not 100% for sure if Olive Films are available on iTunes, but you might want to check there as well. So head on over to www.olivefilms.com to pick up your copy of Night of the Scarecrow. Coming up in about five minutes, we're going to have our feature interview with the man behind Toe Tag Pictures, Fred Vogel. But before that, we're going to go into our next Metal Blade Spotlight. Once again, the name of the band is Apophis. The name of the CD is Prime Incursion. The song is Humanity's Epilogue.
about his films such as August Underground, August Underground's Mortem, The Red Sin Tower, August Underground's Penance, Murder Collection Volume 1, Maskhead, and Sella Tersica, as well as a Necrophagia Sickness. You know, this, again, Totec Pictures is one of those companies, you know, very much along the line of unearthed films. I, I very much appreciate the tenacity and the willingness of a company to put out such extreme stuff. And and the funny thing is, is, you know, a, a lot of times this kind of stuff gets crapped on by mainstream media and, and a lot of sometimes by genre fans. But if there's nothing else that you can say, Fred has certain, Fred and Totag have certainly given us everything that we could have ever asked for in the genre. And speaking of which, 
everyone say hello to Fred Vogel. Fred, how you doing? Good. How you guys doing? We're good, man. We're good. You know, I, I'm really excited about having you on. I, I mentioned at the top of the show, you know, there are very few companies, very few people that have a willingness to put out such extreme product. You know, the only other guy that really comes to mind off the top of my head is Stephen Biro at Unearthed Films, and I think that you both put out amazing product. You know, before we even get into anything too heavy, you know, kind of tell everyone where your love for horror came from. Well, I saw Frankenstein at a really young age. I was like five years old. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, seeing that amazing makeup that Jack Pierce did on Karloff really uh, inspired me. I didn't know what kind of feelings I was having at that, such a young age, but I knew that I liked it. And, um, you know, that was also such a really great time in the early 80s with, like, the birth of the video boom and, you know, Fangoria's being, you know, the Bible. And, uh, you know, as a little kid, it, I just kind of, like, fell into it and my love for the special effects side of the horror movies. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, looking over the toe tag site and and just you know reading your your bio, you know, it's understanding that you you know your love for the film came from Frankenstein and things like this. You know, what what led you to go to such an extreme? You know, it's this is not you know this is not horror that you take home to show mom and dad. This is not horror you, you sit down and show to the kids. What led to you actually going to such an extreme route, especially starting with your first film, August Underground? You know, and the same thing with, like, Frankenstein. Like, you, I just, you know, discovered it, and then I discovered other horror movies that were a little bit more on the extreme side that really kind of turned me on, like films like Last House on the Left, and I Spit on Your Grave, and Last House on Dead End Street, and House on the Edge of the Park. You know, things like that that were kind of, you know, more of the me- more mean-spirited side of horror, like what I really thought horror was all about. Um, and, you know, I was I was literally, I was teaching college at Tom Savini's makeup school when I, uh, when I made August Up the Ground. And I knew at that moment in time, back in 2000, um, I was probably, you know, at the best of my game as a special effects artist. And um, I knew that I could, you know, pull off, what I was hoping was going to look like uh, like a real snuff movie. You know, that was kind of the goal. So uh, it just it all really just stemmed from there, you know. And I, I knew that I wanted to show, you know, serial killers in a negative light and not the way that Hollywood shows them where they kind of glorify the killer. And I knew that if I was sure. going to take that route that uh, I could, you know, I couldn't pull any punches. I really had to go all out or it wasn't going to work. It was going to fail. Now, one of the things that I found – really interesting when when I watched August Underground was it has, you know, it looks like it's shot on, you know, on VHS, you know, it's, you know, similar to if you look at the original guinea pig film that was released through Unearthed Films, um, The Devil's Experiment and things like that, you know, you know, I, I understand what you're saying is, you know, you didn't want to, to Hollywoodize it, you know, make it glamorous, but at the same time, you know, how did the concept actually come to be, you know? Was there a point during the filming where you felt like it was there a line that you wouldn't cross? No, you know, I you know, after like studying serial killers for a whole year and, you know, reading on like what some of the sick shit that these people do, I knew that we had to go all out or nothing and you know, when we broke down the script uh, you know, it was to to be as nasty and as vile as we could be as human beings, you know, and that's the true side of a serial killer, you know, sociopath. And, you know, I was willing to go there, and I just needed to make sure that, uh, you know, I picked the right people, and, you know, the tr- you know there was a lot of trust going on, because um, I did a test um, before I made August Underground, just kind of to see if it, the idea would work, and if it would look mm-hmm. legit, you know, um, because I didn't, there wasn't really found footage movies, you know, for me to even, <clears throat> how it is now, it's kind of ridiculous, but back in, you know, back in 2000, um, you know, the Blair Witch Project just happened, and to sure. me, that was kind of like a huge inspiration because, like, this guy, these guys made their movie with no money, and they and they used this website to build their marketing campaign around. 
So I was like, okay, well, I've got to do something like that. And, you know, the only movies that I can really, uh, you know, kind of pluck from and, like, to show even actors, like, well, this is what I'm trying to do, was, you know, Henry Portrait of Serial Killer. There's that really great home invasion scene. And I remember talking right. to the actors and being like, hey, this is what I'm trying to do for a whole feature film. So, you know, you see how the camera just doesn't, you know, turn away from it. It's all live. It's right there in front of your face. That's really how I wanted to approach it. And then, you know, other films like Cannibal Holocaust and um, The Man Bites Dog, Last House on Dead End Street were all big inspirations. Now, you followed that up. Uh, it was you, uh, Jeremy Cruz, Michael Schneider, uh, Christy Wiles, Shelby Jackson, and Killjoy. You did a sequel, August Underground's Mortem, and if people can believe it or not, Mortem even took it, in my opinion, to the next level. Um, you know, from your site, uh, well, um, it's a classic tale of a man and a woman in love. However, the woman cannot give up her other lover, who happens to be her younger brother. You mm-hmm. exploit the trio of killers and their deviant ways with issues such as child abuse, incest, rape, and their effects on the human psyche. When you guys first started talking about doing a sequel, you know, what were those discussions like? Because I can only imagine, you know, saying to yourself, okay, how do we top the first one? How do we continue the story? You know, kind of talk about how you collaborated with everyone and how the idea for Mortem came to be. You know, Mortem was interesting because it was never, you know, it was never planned to be a sequel. Um mm-hmm. What happened was is I made August Underground with my first company called Absinthe Films. And while uh, I, I just, when um, Alan Peters, who was the cameraman in the first August Underground, he didn't want nothing to do with the movie. And it was really heartbreaking for me because, you know, I just worked my ass off. I literally lost my job because of this movie. Um, and now, you know, the only person that I had when I was making the movie left. So... Um, you know, thank God I had a really great friends and Jeremy Cruz, um, who I went to college with, is just about to hop a plane to go to Los Angeles to uh, become a special effects artist. He just graduated. And I was like, dude, please don't go. Let's try to do, you know, there's some steam coming with this movie, you know, like, I really believe something's going to happen with it. So he was, he was down. And then um, I ran into another filmmaker who I went to the Art Institute with, which was Michael Schneider. And Michael just completed a short film, and I was totally blown away by it. And I'm like, wow, you know, there's people here in Pittsburgh that are making movies. I'm like, I really want to try to do this underground thing and put together, you know, a team. And as this is all happening, um, Killjoy from Necrophagia contacts me because he had seen the movie um, from Rod Godino, who is the owner of Rumor Magazine. And Mm -hmm. Rod Godino was like, He's like, Killjoy, you need to see this movie. There's this guy in Pittsburgh. He's making these kind of movies that are, like, right up your alley. And Killjoy contacted me, and I had no idea who he was. I was, wasn't a fan of Necrophage at the time. Hmm. And uh, from there, you know, he brought a lot of really deviant, you know, stuff to it and was like, hey, I want to shoot a music video, and I want it to be August Underground inspired. So mm-hmm. since, my, since Alan Peters was gone, uh, Michael Schneider was the next guy, you know, he was a cameraman. So, like, I was like, all right, well, let's bring him in and let's just start shooting some scenes um, for this music video for Necrophagia. As this is going along, um, Christy Wilde gets introduced to me, and who is this amazing artist. And her and Michael were talking about it, and they were like, well, we should bring, you know, Christy in and do some stuff. And, you know, Christy was all about doing anything, so that was just really exciting and scary all in the same breath. But, uh, you know, I was just kind of going with the flow. You know, as we're shooting these scenes, August Underground is growing. You know, reviews are, you know, reviews are starting to happen. Rumor d- does the, um, you know, the cover story on the House of a Thousand Corpses issue for the magazine. I wake up to 200 emails from people all over the world wanting this movie. Um and it was kind of like talked about. It's like, hey, let's let's just make this a sequel. Um, you know, I'm already in it. And, you know, Michael's character's in it. Now Christy's character's in it. And I'm like, this brings a really interesting dynamic. And we kind of went from there. Um, Shelby 
was the one who took the photos for the August Underground uh, Rue Morgue spread, and that's how she got involved. And, you know, from there, she was kind of the go-to girl that would, like, oh, shit, we need somebody to die or get naked. You know, she was really willing because she was such an artist. And uh, I fell in love with that. And, you know, later on, married her. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that's kind of really how it all started, you know. It was just, you know, an idea started from this necrophagia music video, and it kind of just grew and grew and grew. And, you know, that's why that movie is such... A, uh, you know, it's 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 really messy, and I think it's because there's oh, a lot yeah. of hands in the pot, and uh, it was really just the birth of something new. It was, it was the birth, you know. I looked at it as like, if if August Underground is going to have any sort of, you know, following or something like this, you know, I want to be able to help out these people because anybody that wants to make these kind of movies, you know, we're not we're not trying to be millionaires. We're not trying to be, you know, rich filmmakers we just really want to express ourselves as artists and you know putting everybody on as a director you know was really like the way that I wanted you know we wanted to take it, it was just like all right this is a really big collaborative piece even though it's right. you know the, it's based off of my ideas but uh you know from now I wanted I wanted to like I wanted to fix it because I wasn't happy with the way things were going with it and while we were shooting the movie, I'm like, well, now i got to do another one because i got to fix this. Now, you had mentioned um, Michael Schneider. Um, he had he left your crew shortly after the wrap on Mortem, and he released his own cut of the film subtitled The Maggot Cut, and then there's the official cut of the film that was released on DVD in 2003. Can you kind of talk about if, if you want to or you can? Can you talk about the differences between the cuts and why there were two cuts of the film? Well, what happened was is we we shot a lot of footage, <clears throat> and um, you know Michael would go out and shoot footage, kind of without us you know knowing about it and kind of surprising us with this footage. And you know some stuff was really great and some stuff was just eh, you know whatever. But at the time, I was I literally was, again, going crazy because, you know, I'm really trying to push the first August Underground, getting into festivals, things like that. Um, next thing I know, I'm on a plane to Europe for a month with, with Killjoy from Necrophagia shooting a documentary over in Europe with him. Mm-hmm. Um, when I came back from Europe, um, they were already starting to work together to put a premiere together. And I was really excited. I'm like, you know, this is this is uh, this is really going to be awesome. I can't wait to get back to see it. I get back home, things are kind of in a mess. Um, Christy and Jeremy, uh, you know, were telling me that you know Michael re-edited the movie and it's not the same as I remembered seeing it before I left. But uh, it was too late. You know, we already had this premiere, so we, show, we ended up showing what is now called, you know, it's called the maggot cut or whatever you want to call it. But that was the first cut of the movie we showed at our premiere um, mm-hmm. in Pittsburgh. And once we saw this cut, we, we knew that, uh, you know, myself, Jeremy, Christy, and Shelby wanted to take it into another direction, and it just wasn't working out with Michael. I think a lot of it also had to do with, um, you know, two egos, you know, my ego and his ego. I created August Underground. Um, you know, this is my thing. Even though this was started off as a video for Necrophagia or whatever, um, it was still my thing. And, you know, I wanted to make it work as a movie. And it was just, it just there was nothing coherent about it. It was just like, even though there, it's supposed to be like a found footage idea, like there still needs to be pieces in there that make you know. Because he didn't re- in, in his cut, you don't know that it's brother and sister. You know, in right. the toe tag version, you hear me say, how can you fuck your brother or whatever, you know. Like I, I, we shot new scenes just so, even though um, it didn't have to be long scenes. It was literally just you know either me screaming or whatever, you know. But it just little things like that. Even if you just hear this dialogue, it establishes the arc of the movie. And, sure. You know, I'm a filmmaker. Granted, I make you know nasty. I you know I was making little nasty stuff movies at the time, but I'm still trying to make a movie. And you know it's important to have you know a story your film 
And uh, even if people don't want to believe it, there is lots of story behind the August on the Rebels. You just have to pay attention. Oh, yeah, I, I would I would agree. Now you um, <clears throat> you know when this came out, there was a lot of controversy about the film. In fact, um, there was a blogger on IGN, Horbrain, who labeled it as the sickest film ever. Uh, the film went on to be banned in several countries due to its nature, and you know people can argue, despite or because of the controversy of your film, it got considerable critical acclaim and press coverage. You know, you had mentioned you know Fangoria, Rumor, you know everybody talking about this film. At this point in time, considering you know about that time is 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 in my opinion when. Society in America really started to become more and more PC, and there was a crackdown for a while on violence in horror films, especially extreme violence. You know, were you guys surprised by how popular the film was and how much critical response you received from it? You know, it definitely was surprising. Um, and it's funny, you know what I mean? You hear the stories of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Night of the Living Dead, you know, those movies really being inspired by the times of, you know, what was going on in the world at the time. You know, there was the same thing with, you know, with Toe Tag and us just being like, man, nobody's making any good horror movies, you know? Like, I don't want to see the fucking faculty, you know? I don't want to see that shit. Like, I want to see some, you know, some really awesome, you know, horror. And... uh you know, in our eyes, we were just like, we're the ones that are going to do it. You know, we right. and we built a we built a really great reputation, even though people were terrified of us. You know, like when people first met us, they were like, oh my god, you know, that, that's fucking toe tag. Those guys like kill people. You know, they, they throw up on you. You know, they're you know, they're, you know, they're monsters. Fred's a fucking monster. But you know, once people started to to see us, and that's because we. Um, you know, we hopped right into the, con- the, con- the horror convention circuit. And, you know, at the time, there wasn't many people doing that in the independent world. So we kind of just, like, jumped in there, and we kind of, like, said, hey, you know, we're horror people, too. Like, we want to we'll, – we'll go stand behind the table, and we'll show our movie and, you know, meet the fans and have screenings of the films and, and do that kind of stuff. So word of mouth really started to spread. And you know, this is before Facebook or any of the social media. So, I mean, it was a really – you know, we really were lucky with the word of mouth and just the support of people wanting to see something disturbing like this. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. Now, you had you had briefly mentioned that you had gone um, overseas for about a month with Killjoy and his band Necrophagia, of course, and being a big metal fan myself, I'm sure as you heard some of the music that was playing, you know, I enjoy Necrophagia, but you did – a documentary on them called Necrophagia Sickness. Um, as an aside for a moment, can you talk about how how was that experience for you, you know, getting away from from the types of film that you made to doing a documentary on necrophagia? You know, it was a trip because, one, I never shot it. I, I did shoot a documentary when I was in college, but, uh, you know, I never shot, like, a music documentary, and, it was just me and a camera. So I, like, I told Kildred, I'm like, well, I'm not going to be able to get as much. This isn't going to look as good, you know, like we really need to put some sort of like style behind it. And that's when he was like, well, hey, you know, like why don't we make it look like, you know, one of your movies and just make it look really real and, you know, see if we can, you know, fool the fans and thinking that Necrophagia drinks blood and kills their fans and shit like that. And I was all about that. So... You know, I went over. I went over there. I did the band's makeup on tour. Jeremy built these amazing stage props. We had these awesome, great straight stage props. Um, and I kind of pulled like the August Underground gimmick to where, like, you know, we took one of our our roadie guys and would I make I made it like a gut bag for him, and I would cut his stomach open and pull his guts and ring him out over the crowd and put him over my shoulder and walk off stage and you know just do little things like that. It was really amazing because I'm a huge I love music and I really started to love necrophagia and, and the talent in the band. And um you know when you're when you're living on a tour bus with, you know, five guys who we had a little bit more because we had an opening band, you, you really bond and fall in love with these people, you know, and it's all you have. They're your brothers, you know. You know, four of you are taking a shit in the morning at the low, at the, the rest stop, you know what I mean? It's like that's how it is. It's brotherhood <laughs> and uh, 
you know, Killjoy Till to this day is, is still one of my best friends, and that was definitely one of the best experiences. And it was my first time in Europe. And, you know, to be 25 years old, you know, 25, 26 or something like that, I, I mean, it was really great just to get over there. Now, on April 1st of 2004, you and Jeremy Cruz went ahead and incorporated, and Toe Tag Pictures became an official thing. You know, and then after that, you did uh, makeup and special effects and acted in Nick Palumbo's film, Murder Set Pieces. Can you kind of talk about, at, at, at that point in time, you know, why did you decide to, uh, you know, make Toe Tag Pictures happen at that point, and how did you become involved with Nick Palumbo's murder set pieces? It was always, you know, um, again, filmmaker business. You know, we were trying to, we were trying to like start, you know, our own little cult. You know, our own Toe Tag. You know, our sickos, uh, our fan base. You know, we wanted it all. We wanted to be like this punk rock hub to where. You know, we were turning everybody on to our our sickness. And, you know, you need to be a corporation. And you know, as soon as we made it as soon as we made enough money, we we incorporated Totag. And um, you know, that made us legit. You know, that was that was like, okay, you know, now we're for real. And we're not just, you know, a bunch of kids saying, Hey, we got a company. I got a company and uh, you know, I think that's a problem with a lot of filmmakers is they don't realize that, you know, you have to be a business. You know, if you're mm-hmm. making something and selling something, you know, you have to be a business and you have to pay your taxes. And, um, you know, that's something that, you know, Totag knew right away. It was like, all right, this is how we're going to approach this. Um, while I was away over in Europe, um, I was getting emails from Nick Palumbo. Again, uh, Rod Gadino from Rumor Magazine, you know, he called Nick Palumbo because Nick made a movie called Nutbag that was uh, – you know, pretty sleazy and violent. And, uh, you know, Ragadino said, hey, Nick, you know, there's this guy in Pittsburgh. He's making these really nasty movies. you got to see these movies. So he ended up seeing, you know, August Underground and um, August Underground's Mortem. And uh, he's like, I want that shit in my movie. He's like, we're shooting a, thir- he's like, we're shooting a 35 millimeter and I'm having movie stars in it and I want you guys the effects. And Jeremy and I were, you know, elated. I mean, it was like, wow, we're going to be shooting, making a movie on 35. Like, now this is still in the time where 35 millimeter is still a big deal. And sure. And just, just us to have our effects in something that was shot on 35 millimeter film, you know, Jeremy and I understood that, and we were like, yes, you know, where do we sign? Um, you know, Murder Set Pieces was my best and worst experiences ever on a movie. But, uh, you know, it was, it was a really great learning experience. And, you know, I've met a lot of friends to this day on that movie. Um, one of my the grips on Murder Set Pieces was my DP on the Redson Tower. Um, you know, I've, I've also done stuff with Jade Risser. You know, she was in Cell for me. Um, so, I mean, I, I, have, I have a lot of love for Murder Set Pieces, even though it's, you know, how I'm about to make a movie. <laughs> Now, you talked about murder set pieces being shot on 35. Now, I'm, I'm guessing, I could be wrong, please correct me, that August Underground and Mortem were not shot on 35. You know, no. as a fellow effects artist, you know, I've been lucky enough as well to shoot on digital and shoot on 35. And for me, there's a quantum difference in how you approach and do effects when you're shooting on 35 as, as opposed to shooting digitally. For you, did you find any particular challenges going from from a digital format to a 35 millimeter format? You know, not really. Um, we re- we were so into doing the most brutal effects for this movie. You know, we were every day. It was like Nick, we got this idea, and he was, and, and that's the best thing about Nick was like he was like, yes, he's like the more blood, the sicker, the better. His his idea was, uh, you know, Murder Set Pieces is going to be the first NC-17 horror film, you know, in years. And we were like, fuck yeah, man. Like, we're in on that shit. Like, we're going to make this as violent and dirty as possible, you know. And he said, you know, he wanted to see a girl, like, shit herself when she gets a nail through her hand. We were like, fuck yeah. 
you know, there was nothing that we were going to be like, nope, I'm sorry, buddy, we're not going to do that. You know, we were just all about um, putting our stamp in horror, you know what I mean? Like, in, in, with Jeremy and I being both, you know, huge fans of Savini, you know, we just wanted to, like, make the best gory kind of maniac, <laughs> if you will, you know, for murder set pieces. Now, the first time Toe Tag came to my attention was 10 years ago, and, and I'm pretty sure this is – you're going to get heated about this, and, and I hope you do because I felt the same way about it. Ten years ago, you were en route to the 2005 Rue Morgue Festival of Fear in Toronto. You were stopped by Canadian customs officers for transporting what they called merchandise across the border. They confiscated your van. They confiscated all your promotional materials as well as copies of Mortem and the original August Underground. And you were, bit, you were arrested for smuggling, quote-unquote, obscene materials into Canada. While they were inspecting your stuff in Ottawa, you were actually held in a, a Canadian customs jail. After 10 hours, you were released and the charges were dropped. I, you know, I don't even know where to start with this because I, I, I remember it was about this uh, – wasn't that – it was about four years before that. I'd gotten into a huge argument with um, Best Buy as a company because they uh, they pulled a censorship thing on um, Unearthed Films um, – Oh, why am I drawing a blank on it? Um, Nacho Serrata's film, Aftermath Genesis, saying that it was just too gruesome, it was too this, it was too that. They threatened to sue me over an article. I'm curious, on your end, you know, how did you feel when this happened? You know, did, you know, were they tipped off that you were coming? How did this, how did that shit even happen to begin with? Yeah, I'm a red light, unfortunately. You know, when, uh, when I was making, when I made August Underground, you know, it was 2001, and, you know, America was in high alert. As I was sending screeners across the country, even across over to Europe for August Underground, um, you know, it, it definitely, like, landed on the radar of something that is obscene. Um, the Fantasia Film Festival was one of the places where I'm like, man, this August Underground is going to kill it up at the Fantasia Film Festival. Unfortunately, the Fantasia Film Festival had their own problems because, uh, you know, films uh, like Subconscious Cruelty were even so extreme for Canada. I remember they had a hard time playing that. And, you know, that's where Aftermath premiered, you know what I mean? Like, that's, mm-hmm. Fantasia was a really great, you know, it, it's, and it still is, like, one of the best, you know, film festivals out there. And when, when I sent August Underground to Mitch over at the Fantasia Film Festival... I really think that's kind of when it popped on the radar for them because, uh, you know, they were already being investigated for all the films that they were bringing in. So, you know, I just ended up, you know, Fred Vogel, August Underground, check. And uh, that's kind of, I think, that right there is the catalyst for me getting in trouble when we crossed the border into Toronto for the Festival of Fear. I mean, but, but I mean, I, I, I guess where I'm going is, is you know, were they actually physically waiting for you at the border? I mean, did they? What did they say to you when they pulled no, you? No, no. I mean, it, it, they were. You know, you stop at the border. And you're like, hey, I'm like, hey, you know, we're coming into Canada to go to the Festival of Fear. Um, it's called the Fan Expo, and they're like, oh, okay, um, can you just pull over? So, you know, of course, we we pull over. Now, this is at three o'clock in the morning. None of us had any sleep because we had. Uh, Jeremy, Christy, and Shelby have been working up, working all night trying to build this Cinnabite costume for Clive Barker, who was also a guest at the festival. So, you know, I'm driving, and everybody is like half asleep in the back when I I have to pull the van over. And literally, we go inside and end up talking to one of the, the officers in there. And he asked us, you know, what do we do? And we kind of told him, and, we're, you know, we're all proud of what we do, and we make horror movies, and... You know, it was no big deal. And then all of a sudden, two two officers or whatever they are um, walked out and said, Fred Vogel? And I said, yes. They're like, come with me. So I figured because I was driving or whatever, I'm the one that they wanted to speak to. I ended up going into this back room, 
and they sat me down and pretty much dropped a law book in front of me and just kept flipping through pages saying, we're placing you under arrest for this, for this, for this. And, uh, you know, every law that I broke, my eyes are getting bigger. And that's when, like, the fear set in. It's like, oh, my God, I'm like, I'm going to be getting arrested for my art. And as cool as I thought it might have been a few years ago, you know, the, I thought the dust settled. I didn't think anything was going to happen. And then now I'm going up to sign autographs in Canada, and now I'm getting arrested. So it was, it was definitely pretty heavy. It's just, it's absolutely stunning to me. So after this 10 hours that they held you, you were released and the charges were dropped. What did they say to you at that point? No, they didn't. They did background checks on me. You know, they they flew. Somebody from Ottawa came in, um, and you know, they were like, "Wait a minute, this guy has nothing. You know, he doesn't even have a parking ticket. You know, he just he was teaching college. They did, they really did the research on who I was, and um, they were just like, you 'You're not bringing this filth into our country. You're like, you get everything in your vehicle stays here, and you can go or you go home.'" And I was like, man, I, I'm like, you know, we got to do this makeup for Clyde Barker. I'm like, I, there's no way I would ruin that for, you know, Christy, Jeremy, and Shelby. And we went to the Festival of Fear with nothing. I literally had nothing to sell. I had nothing. I was just, it was, it was, it was really hard. It was really hard for us. Did you have any legal recourse after that? Did you get all of your merchandise back when you left the country? Absolutely. Um, we, we came back, we stopped there, um, they were, to, it was picked through, you know what I mean? It was pretty funny, but it looked like, you know, people, you know, picked through some of the stuff, but, uh, it was, uh, we were able to take it back into the States and I, as much as I love Canada and I love my Canadian friends up there, uh, I, I'm really nervous every time I step foot <laughs> hmm. over the border. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry that that happened. Like I said, that was the first time that at that point that you guys had come up, you know, in my radar, like I said, 10 years ago, and, and I started looking into you guys then. So I've been definitely been following you since that entire incident. But let's get off of that bullshit for, for a while now. I'm very sorry that that happened to you. Now, a- after that incident, in 2006, you guys did your third film uh, as Toe Tag Pictures, and that was The Red Sin Tower. And one of the things that people will notice right away when you watch the Redson Tower is how dramatic of a leap it is in visual and audio quality from August Underground and, and Mortem. You know, was it a conscious decision for you to go with a more linear plot as opposed to more of a um, – I'm trying to think of how I want to put it – more of a found footage type film? And how did the concept for Redson Tower come to be? Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to show people that I can make real movies. <laughs> you know, the this, uh, this, this snuff-looking um, found footage style, you know, we really, I think, you know, we really learned to, to cut our chops and build our brand of special effects. I think that's really where we hone that in um, because, that, you know, we were trying to do these really realistic effects and without camera cuts. In a traditional film, you know, there's different cuts. You see a, a knife going up, you see a woman's reaction, you see a knife going into something fake or blood hitting a wall or something like that. And at Toe Tag, we were trying to do stuff that was like, all right, you're seeing it all, boom, right in front of you. So from there, wanting to make something more linear, more of a movie, was it was really important for me because, again, it's like, oh, Fred Vogel made August Underground, now he made August Underground's Mortem, and it's the same thing, like, does this, can this guy do anything else, or he's the snuff guy, and um, I wanted to make, you know, movie movies when I first started making movies. It's not that I, I said, hey, I want to kind of create this, you know, this fake, you know, found footage world, and that's the kind of route I want to take. It was never about that. It was about making, making, making movies. And August Underground's Penance I, you know, I wrote the script, and it was going to be half movie, half found footage film. So it was going to like mm-hmm. go from, um, you know, a real linear style of filmmaking to the, you know, when the camera picks up, there it is. But I didn't want to jump right back into doing another August Underground, and um, we kind of all just put our heads together and said, like, well, let's do something different. And I came up with this 
this name, Redson Tower. And I said, let's make a, you know, we're, let's, if Toe Tag was going to do a mainstream movie, what would it be? And that was pretty much the idea. I was like, okay, what works? Kids going into a tower. You know, it was the same, um, you know, we weren't trying to reinvent the wheel. It was we, we understood what we wanted to do. We wanted to have, you know, a bunch of kills. We wanted to have, you know, boobs in it. You know, it, it was uh, our attempt at a mainstream movie, but, you know, as we're making it, it becomes, it's total toe tag because it's, you know, it's, it's extreme and, you, you know, you don't see, you know, vaginas and demon babies coming out of it in your mainstream movies. Yeah. No. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. I wish we had more of that. I might watch more mainstream film if that was the case. <laughs> now, of course, you know, that film I thought was, was really well done. And then, of course, your next film, you did another August Underground film, Penance. Yeah. Um, at, you know, at that point in time, you know, had there been, you know, did you ever have thoughts of it being a trilogy? And, <clears throat> you know, what did you try to do different with Penance that you had not done in the previous two August Underground films? Um, you know, I when we were shooting August Underground's Mortem, I knew that I had to do a third one. Again, just because it wasn't it wasn't fully mine, you know. As much as it, you know, I I love August Underground's more than I mean, just wasn't as, as August Underground was mine. You know, this was kind of a collective piece going off of you know my ideas. But when it came time for penance, um, you know, I really wanted to show you know the full arc of the of, of these characters and and watch them decline. That was really important to me. It was like watching you know, these characters that you already don't like, you know, just fall deeper and deeper and deeper into the shit world that they live in. Right. Um, but at the time, we just got off the Red Sea Tower. You know, we, you know, it played, it, it played Fantasia. It sold that out. It sold the U.S. out. It sold Pittsburgh out. Every screening we had, we sold it out. It was, you know, we were ready to take this big, this big, huge ride. And... As that's going on, I'm like, well, you know, I can make, let's, 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 you know, why this is going on, let's make this other movie and just follow it up with August Underground's Penance and make fucking sickest August Underground movie that we could do. Mm-hmm. So that's what we did. And, you know, you know, at the time we did August Underground's Mortem, I didn't know Christy that well. Um, you know, uh, she was definitely using different motivation to get her through the scenes. By the time we got, did August Underground's Penance, she was a very happy, free-spirited woman, um, you know, and it was more acting instead of, you know, going more method that she did in the first one, or in, the, in August Underground's mm-hmm. Mortem. So to me, that was a treat because, you know, in August Underground's Mortem, when you see, like, you know, her or Michael, you know, cutting themselves or doing stuff like that, that was real. And I was like, wait a minute, guys, you don't have to do that. Like, Jeremy here, he's the effects guy, and he can put those cuts on you, and you don't need to do that. But, but So by the time we did Penance, that was gone. And it was two actors working together to really, you know, jump from being a, being a Fred Roller or Christy Wiles to being these two characters. So, I mean, that was really exciting to me. Definitely, you know, and and that's interesting to to hear you say that. Um, you know, and and I, I had wanted to ask you a little bit um, about Christy. Of you know, I find it interesting that um, <laughs> you know my my ex wife uh, was not a fan of me working in horror films. You know, kind of talk about what it's like having a spouse that is so involved in your work. It's, it's amazing, man. Um, I'm, I seriously lucked out and, and married like the, the greatest woman ever. You know, I showed her August underground when we first met before she was going to do the photo shoot. Um, Shelby, I knew she was open-minded when I went over her house, like for the first time she had, uh, you know, zombie and, Hellraiser and her DVDs. And I'm like, oh, this girl likes horror movies. I'm like, well, if she can, if she can sit through this, then you know, maybe we have something here. And she got it. <laughs> She's a keeper. And you know, she, you know, Shelby is open-minded, and you know, Shelby is even though like we make these really nasty movies, like Shelby is the most lovable 
you know, fun, you know, fun person you can ever be around if you ask anybody. And uh, she got it. You know, she knew that I'm, you know, this is my outlet. You know, I make horror movies. And before she brought the package, like, this is, this is, this is who I am. You know, I'm, I'm put here to make movies. This is what I do. And she got it. And she supported it. And she got involved in it. And seeing her talent as a writer when we did the Red Sea Tower, you know, to her talent as a producer or, you know, whatever she needs to be. You know, Shelby Gogol can jump in and wear 50 hats. And that's, you know, she's amazing. Now, one of the one of the films that's on on your um, resume that I have not seen, but it, it's definitely caught my attention. I'm going to have to order it from you guys. You kind of went into the Mondo style of film with Murder Collection Volume One. Kind of tell us about that film, how it came to be, and and I like the premise for the film. Um, again, quoting from your quoting from your site. Um, Revives an early 1990s internet clip show, Murder, which was notorious for streaming videos of actual killings. After gaining popularity, the infamous show was discovered by authorities and shut down, forcing the host, Balin, into obscurity. A decade later, he continues to search for scenes of brutality and is eager to share his collection with everybody. Kind of talk about how this project came about and what your inspiration for it was. Um, so after after August Underground's tenants, I w- really wanted to start cracking down on working on my next big movie. And I, you know, I'm a huge Frankenstein fan, and I ended up uh, writing a script with um, with Don Moore, who ended up, you know, working and writing on Celtrica. But him and I ended up we worked on a script for my Frankenstein movie, and I was starting to, you know, try to go for something bigger. You know, like okay, um, I made these movies. And now I have, I got a few movies under my belt. Let me really try to, to raise some big money and, and make this bigger movie. Well, that was a lot harder than I thought. So, you know, two years went by, and I needed to feed my Toe Tags family. And at just that moment in time, this nasty little video came out called like Two Guys and a Hammer or something like that. <laughs> um, which totally reminded me of August Underground. And the person that sent it to me, this, you know, back in the day, Totag had this really amazing forums on our website. And one of the things was there was no real violence on, you know, on the Totag forums. But somebody contacted me and, sh- and sent me this link and said, Fred, I know you don't tolerate real violence, but if you can just tell me if this is real or if this is special effects. And, you know, after watching it for two minutes, I knew that it was real. And... Mm. You know, I end up calling Jeremy into the room. I end up calling Shelby into the room. At this moment in time, Christy was kind of uh, falling out of toe tag. And mm-hmm. um, I was like, you know, I have a really great idea. I'm like, we can create this. You know, like, we're we're the masters of this shit. Like, I'm like, what if we made something that looked authentic but, you know, with just toe tag, you know, doing, replicating these kind of these kind of vignettes that you would see on the Internet, like these real death clips. So that's really how it got started. And, you know, I came, I came up with the idea of, you know, Balin and the show being on the Internet. Um, you know, back in the day, I remember it was kind of like a rite of passage. As soon as you got on the Internet, it was sort of like rotten.com or whatever, you know. Oh, yeah. You're, you're into that kind of stuff. And... Um, you know, I just thought about, like, look how early that was, you know. Be, I remember it was just pictures before there were videos. It was, it, that's what it was. So I really wanted to try to, like, create something new and different that was kind of like our own faces of death. And that's how Murder Collection was born. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, I watched the trailer for it, and, and it's definitely intrigued me. I'm definitely looking forward to ordering a copy of that and uh, doing a review for it review for it. It's definitely up my alley. It's my style of film. And you know, I'm I'm one of those if you want to call us sickos then enjoy that kind of and you know, that kind of work. Now yeah, it's, after it's, it's that, one of my favorites. It, it, it's one of my favorites and it it, it really shows even though you're watching the silence on there, you know, it again, I I make movies that kind of like ask you why. You know, what's 
why you why you are you into violence? Why am I into violent movies? You know, I always tell people that I have a macabre gene. <laughs> you know, I'm just I'm just, I, I'm just you know drawn more to darker things. And with Murder Collection, that was a really big point. And you know, some of the scenes in the film um, will really make you question. You know what I mean? Like, sure. Like, yeah, and that's what I really love about it. Now, after that, you guys did. Um Maskhead in 2009, and again, mm-hmm. it's it's one that I have not had the ability to see yet, but, you know, watching the trailer, I was kind of like, it, it gave me goosebumps almost. I don't, I don't know how else to put it to you. Kind of talk about how Maskhead came to be, and again, it, it has more of that visual look and style to me of Red Sin Tower. Were you, again, just trying to show people that you could go that route with a film, or did, were you, did you just need a break from that found footage, quote-unquote, live footage look in what you were doing? So, you know, we make Murder Collection, and I didn't tell anybody that I was even making a movie. I literally just like, all right, here it is, new Totag movie, it's called Murder Collection. Boom, there it was. Um, at that time, uh, Scott Swan contacted me. Scott Swan wrote John Carpenter's Cigarette Burns for the Masters of Horror, um, which I was a huge fan of. His His segment mm-hmm. was just the best. And this, you know, this guy from Hollywood, you know, contacts me and he's like, hey, I'm a huge fan of yours and, you know, I'd love to make an underground movie. Um, you know, would you ever want to, like, get together and try to work on something? So we ended up collaborating on something. We were going to do this movie about Lee Harvey Oswald, um, something that we might do in the future. Um, so I really love the idea. But it was just too big. And there was no way that, you know, get the period in the cars. And you know, as much as Pittsburgh looks like 1963, you know, you still need to, you need that money for the cars and, and the wardrobe and things like that. And that's something sure. that we didn't have. It. So he's just like, well, I've been playing with, around with this idea. You know, let me know what you think. And he tells me this idea you know, called Maskhead. And, you know, at first I was just like, Maskhead? I'm like, dude, we need a better fucking name than that. You know, like, I'm known for, you know, I like having names that are kind of different instead of masthead. It's totally grown on me <laughs> now, but at the time, I just was like, ah, okay, whatever. I was just excited that uh, I get to make a movie with this Hollywood guy. And, right. And, you know, I didn't know Swan from, you know, at all. And he was just like, well, I'm coming to Pittsburgh, we're going to make this movie. So he literally comes to Pittsburgh and I planned everything I had I, I got I cast the movie I had everything ready so when we when he kind of came in it was like all right now I'm going to show you how how I make a movie and we're going to do this together so we, you know Swan and I had a really great relationship and he he learned a lot on how to make like you know an underground movie which is totally different than making a Hollywood film you know, when, sure. you, when you're making a Hollywood movie, you know, you're sitting around for hours. When you're making a toe tag movie, you're working your ass off. So um, <laughs> it was it was just a little different, but, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun. And, you know, Maskhead is, is certainly sleazy and dirty, and it's it, def- it, it fits into the, to the filmography, even though you can definitely tell that it's like the adopted child. Now, the last film that you guys did was in 2010, and, I, and I'm hoping I'm saying this right. Sella Tersica? Is that Sela correct? Sella Tersica. Yes, Sella Tersica. Okay, Tersica. Okay. And it's about a paralyzed soldier that returns from war to his family, and he's actually in worse shape than anyone could even believe. And, the, again, the trailer gave me that, that those goosebumps, you know, is – um, you know, I loved what I saw of the makeup and, and the premise. You know, c- did you make this film into response to everything that's happened to, you know, the troops over overseas? You know, what was the concept for this particular film? You know, it was, again, it was a little bit of everything. Um, you know, we're lied to as, as a people. And, you know, one of the things that... Uh, you know, here at Toe Tags, we all kind of believe to be open-minded people and to, you know, not be fooled by the man. So we kind of, like, do our best to be open-minded and, you know, think for ourselves and whatever we want to believe, we believe. And, 
Jeremy's cousin just so happened to be like a motherfucking G.I. Joe. You know, this guy served over in Iraq, and he, you know, he did tour after tour after tour. He'd come home, he'd make a baby, he'd go away, he'd come back, make another, you know what I mean? The guy was like a, you know, true G.I. Joe. And I just found that so fascinating that, you know, and I love this guy. You know, he Jeremy's cousin would come home, and I would see him, and then, you know, you'd kind of forget that he was away because, you know, he wasn't around all the time. But then all of a sudden he'd come home and say, oh, my God, I'm so excited to see him and, you know, kind of hear his stories. And we pretty much just, you know, we built it around that. And also at the same time, Toe Tag was going through this big, huge change. We were, you know, we were really trying to grow, you know, with merchandising and building our brand, changing from Toe Tag Pictures to Toe Tag Inc. Um, you know, little things like that. And a lot of things are just fuck with your head. You know, there's a lot of people telling us one thing and other things happening. And, you know, it was really important for us just to kind of stay to stay true and not let that thing in our head get to us. And that's what Celeturska is. You know, Celeturska is your, where your pituitary gland sits in the back of your skull. So it has to do with, it has to do with your head. I know you haven't seen the movie, I don't want to give it away. But uh, it, has to, it has to do with the head. How was it working with Camille Keaton on that film? Oh, it was, it was beautiful, man. Um, you know, <laughs> Toe Tag could, could have had many, many, you know, genre people in our movies if we wanted to. We have a lot of great friends in the genre that, you know, would definitely work with us if we, if we wanted it to. But uh, when it came time to pick our first kind of movie star to be in one of our films, uh, there was only one person that can fill that role, and that was Camille Keaton. Um, I stood on your grave with such an important movie to an adolescent Fred who, you know, found it disturbing and erotic and, uh, you know, it, it it made this little boy happy when he watched it when he was a kid. So, you know, getting a chance to to meet her and for her to say, hey, yeah, I don't know who you guys are. Oh, you're known for making these movies where you cut off girls' nipples and smear shit into them and you know, for her to be like, hey, you know, I'll vote for your film. That was really a big, a big moment for us. So it was mm-hmm. great. Now, one of the things that you guys are really known for, and I'm a big proponent of, you know, I collect DVD, I collect Blu-ray, you know, I collect film on, on any medium I can get my hands on. One of the things that I really like is when you guys put out something, it's, You know, it's balls out, collector's edition, loaded with features, things like that. You know, kind of talk about how or or why you guys have done that when so many other companies just kind of dump things to disc and just try to sell it for as much as they can. The stuff that you guys put out is such collectible quality stuff. You know, I'm a collector too. You know, I have the movie collection. I've always had the movie collection. Um, and, you know, it was really important for us because of us being fans to give the fans back something they would be proud of. And we knew going in, um, we wanted to be the best that there was, you know, back in, two, you know, when, when August Underground's Mortem, which was our first DVD, you know, when we had people say, you know, you should just burn it to a DVD R and put it out that way. And I'm like, well, that's not real. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this is, I want people to know that this is a real deal DVD. And, you know, when we're selling these movies, you know, across the country to Europe, you know, people are getting a DVD and they, and if they're going to be spending $30, cause back, back in the day, that's how much they were. Um, and even the snuff editions were more expensive. They were 40. So it was like, if people are going to be spending this kind of money, I don't want people spending their money on a DVD R. I want them to have the best, you know, disc packaging or whatever that we can do to make it great. And that really just stems from us being, you know, fans ourselves and not wanting to, you know, to rip our our own fans off. Now, you guys have moved on to, you know, not only do you make your own films, but now, of course, you guys have done effects for other people's films. You guys are releasing other people's films, you know. How much you know? How much? How much does that inspire you to see other people? I'm, I'm not going to say emulate you or follow in your footsteps, but are definitely trying to do the same kind of work that you're doing. You know, how much satisfaction does it give you to be able to promote other filmmakers who are doing that style of film work? 
Oh, it's it's great satisfaction. You know, um, back when we started, there was nobody there to support us. Um, mm-hmm. We we pretty much had to, you know, scream at the top of our lungs, "We're here! This is, these are our kind, these are our movies. This is what we do." Until people started to pay attention. Um, nobody wanted to pick up August Underground for distribution. Um, you know, Unearth literally was just starting at the same time. So I mean, it was right. You know, we were we were we were both kind of coming out of the gate, and um, you know, one of the things that I realized especially at this early stage was, you know, um, I wanted to own my material. And Roger Watkins, the director of Last House and Dead End Street, um, you know, he told me, he's just like, Fred, he's like, you know, distribution people are going to fuck you. And, you know, you just need to be, you either need to be prepared to get fucked or you need to do something about it. So I was like, well, you know, what if I, what if I am my own distribution company? You know, what if I can spread this word of mouth or whatever, you know, maybe I can get these movies out there. And that's that's what happened. And, you know, our our distribution started from us just going from convention to convention until, until you know, getting $40 to get our, our, our first P.O. box, you know, and then putting ads and, you know, get a little bit of money. And we were playing, let's put an ad in Room Order. Let's put an ad in Ultraviolet Magazine. Let's, you know, maybe that'll help. Um you know, and that's that's really how it all started. It literally was just word of mouth, and people just, oh my God, did you ever see this movie on this underground? Or did you ever see this movie? And that's really how it started. And you know, now that I look back and I see um, this next generation of filmmakers kind of doing the exact doing this, what we've done, it's because you know we've we gave them that path and say, hey, you know, you can make money this way. You know, there's filmmakers that I've gone up to, you know, who. You know, like Keith Boyd Jr., he's a filmmaker that we put out, one of his, his two short films. And I met him when he was like 15, 16 years old. He came to the Totag studio. Oh, I want to make movies. You know, what do I do? And I told him, like, you know, you got to go to school. You got to learn. You got to practice your craft. You know, you just, just can't jump into it. You need to know filmmaking. And right. he did. And I was so proud of him. And that's why he was the first, you know, the, he was the first uh Shorts to for us to put out under our toe tag releasing label, and other filmmakers like Jason Hoover who runs Jab, and you know filmmakers like Adam Albrand, and you know stuff like that. I'm I'm glad that toe tag can influence and uh, make them you know make them grow and influence other filmmakers too. Um, we only have a few minutes left because I don't, I don't want to keep you on too much longer. You know I know I know you have stuff to do, but just a few short questions. Um, you know, I asked Stephen Biro this when I had him on a couple of weeks ago. You know, because Unearth, just like you guys, you know, they're pretty balls out. They'll put anything out there. And I asked Stephen, since he's moved into making films now, is there a subject, is there anything out there that's too taboo for you to put on film? Um, you know... It's it's a really hard question for me to answer because I'm not at that you know I'm not at that at that point yet you know when I'm discussing that um, you know I know you didn't see Maskhead I don't want to give something away but the end of Maskhead was something that was like all right well we're gonna show this and this is gonna be pretty fucking heavy duty you know or in August Underground's Mortem with the little girl in the bathtub at the end you know we're gonna show this and we're gonna you know let's see what this does. And, uh, you know, the way Toe Tag works is if we all believe in it, it gets put in there and, you know, we're the, we're the, we're our worst, our own critics. So if, if it's something that we don't all agree on, then it, w- it won't go in the movie. Now, it's been just about five years since you guys have made a film. What's on the horizon for you guys? Is there going to be another August Underground film, or are we going to see something completely new and different from you? Um, You're going to be something completely different. Um, My next movie is called Pittsburgh Body Removal, and it is about the people in Pittsburgh that pick up the dead. Um, It's going to be my first big-budget film. And with movie stars and all kinds of great stuff in it, 
um, but I can't really talk about it because I'm still in the negotiation stages of things, and I'm also one of those people that don't like to, you know, jinx anything, so I don't like to talk a lot sure, about, sure. you know, my up-and-coming projects, but that is my next movie that I'm working on right now, and I'm super excited about it. As far as the genre goes, looking at, at what we see today, everything that's put out, what's crammed down our throat by Hollywood, what do you think the current state of the horror industry is? You know, right now it's it's very bubblegum. You know, it's it's right now we're we're <laughs> we're surrounded by the Walking Dead virus. And, uh, which is, you know, which is interesting because, you know, if I was 12 years old and I was watching The Walking Dead, it would be my favorite TV show on, you know what I mean? The Walking Dead, as an effects person, you know, it's great. You know, you see these awesome makeups, you know, Greg Nicotero's doing these, you know, amazing makeups on the sh- for the show. And, um, but what it's doing is it's, it's opening a horror to, to more people. And any time you open the door to more people, you know what I mean, it, it you're not, you're not paying attention anymore. Just more people are coming in, and it becomes it's easier just to make crap. And right. uh, I think that you know the purest, you know the, the underground is is really where it's at. And I think you know that's where you know even if it's a smaller budgeted stuff, the stuff where you know people have to work for their movies. And I, I respect a lot of those filmmakers. I respect a lot of you know a lot of guys just making stuff. Uh, for not a lot of money, but really making something, um, you know, provoking and intense and stuff like that. I just saw a movie called Headless, um, which is making its its rounds. It's a really nice, uh, nasty little throwback to the 70s slasher film. Yeah, a lot of people you know, have been it, telling me I need to check that one out, too. I have not che- <laughs> I have not seen that yet. Yeah, you know, another one, uh, Pieces of Talent, which is another great one. So I mean, you know, I'm I'm not worried. I, I know there's some really great filmmakers out there making some great movies. So just like every generation, you know, there will always be its mainstream crap and if you're a true horror fan, you will filter through that shit and you will find something special in the underground. I agree. You know, Fred, I wanna say thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for so much of of the entertainment and having the balls to be the filmmaker that you are and and giving a voice to the underground horror movie fan because you're right there really is not a lot of that out there you know you're always welcome here at horror society you, you know if you ever have any news or anything let me know and i'll put it up but if people want to get your films if they want to find out about your company i saw on the page where you have investor opportunities you know where can people go to find out about you, buy your films? You know, do you have any convention appearances coming up? I do have a big one coming up. I have Cinema Wasteland in Strongsville, Ohio, which is our, our pretty much our main show. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great lineup. It's got the biggest Dawn of the Dead re, or Day of the Dead reunion um, I think ever put together. So I'm really excited about that, and we're excited to. Uh, you know, have the Redson Tower at the at the Cinema Wasteland for the first time um, with this new five disc special edition that we just put out. So mm-hmm. I'm excited to I'm excited to turn people onto that because I'm so proud of that edition, five discs for under thirty you know for thirty bucks. Um, it's got a it's two and a half hour documentary. Deal. Yeah, it's got a two and a half hour documentary. It, it's really loaded. So. Um, Stoked about that, but yeah, contact.biz is my website. That's B I Z, um, and you can get all your cool toe tag stuff there, movies, you know, t-shirts, posters, all that kind of stuff. Vinyl, you need it, you got it. Well, Fred, again, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you spending the time to talk horror and your work with us. And again, like I said, if there's anything Horror Society can ever do for you or the, or the podcast can do for you, let me know. You're always welcome, brother. Thank you, man. You know, Horror Society has always been good to us for even from back in the day. I remember Mitch back in the day being a you know, big fan of the August Underground movies and stuff like that. So, Well, again, man, keep it bloody, keep the blood going, keep the heads rolling, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Fred. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the legendary Fred Vogel of Toe Tag Pictures. Make sure to head on over to his site and pick up your copies of August Underground, August Underground's Mortem, 
The Red Sin Tower, August Underground's Penance, Murder Collection Volume 1, Maskhead, and I know I'm going to butcher it when I say it again, Sela Tersica, I know I said it wrong, and uh, if you get a chance to check out Necrophagia Sickness, do that as well. Coming up in a few minutes, we're going to go into our final digital dismemberment spotlight, which will be on Scream Factory's special edition Blu-ray release of Class of 1984. But before that, we're going to play our final song in our Metal Blade spotlight. Once again, the name of the band is Apothesis. Apothesis. I know I'm saying that wrong, too. Apoth- Apothesis. Uh Prime Incursion is the name of the CD. Ego is the song. I'm not a man of 
welcome back. You heard the final song in our Metal Blade Spotlight from Apophis. The name of the CD is Prime Incursion. The song was Ego. Make sure to head on over to www.metalblade.com to find out all the information on this band and all of the other great Metal Blade bands and music that they send us for this show. Find out where they're touring and pick up the latest CD. Just want to say, make sure to head on over to livingdeadmagazine.com to pick up the most recent issue. And keep an eye out. The new issue should be going to the printers and hitting newsstands here very shortly. This, The upcoming issue will focus primarily on women in horror. And I have an interview with the one and only Queen of Scream, Debbie Rochon. As soon as release dates are announced for it, I will let everybody know. But now it's time, once again, for digital dismemberment. <laughs> Final digital dismemberment spotlight for the evening. We are covering Scream Factory's special edition Blu ray release of Class of 1984. Drug dealing, gang beatings, prostitution. They are all a part of a typical day for the students of Lincoln High. Take a trip into this academic abyss with Scream Factory's release of Class of 1984, available April 14, 2015. The film makes its Blu-ray debut as part of a collector's edition combo pack that comes loaded with bonus features, including new interviews with director Mark Lester, composer Lalo Schifrin, and actors Perry King, Lisa Langelies, and Aaron Noble. A new career retrospective interview with Perry King, audio commentary with director Mark Lester, and the featurette Blood and Blackboards, which includes interviews with director Mark Lester, actors Perry King, Mary Lynn Ross, and more. Fans who order directly from ShoutFactory.com will <clears throat> will have their order shipped two weeks early, and while supplies last, will also include a limited edition 18 by 24 poster of the newly commissioned artwork. Directed and co-written by Mark L. Lester, um, who also did Commando and Firestarter, Class of 1984, with its vision of a decaying, violence-plagued inner-city school, is one of the most provocative cult movies of the early 1980s. With an original story and screenplay co-written by genre veteran Tom Holland, who also did Fright Night, Child's Play, Psycho 2, and The Beast Within, the film is also notable for its Alice Cooper theme song, I Am the Future, as well as its memorable cast, which includes Lisa Langelies from Deadly Eyes and The Nest, Roddy McDowell, Stephen um, Arngrim of Fear No Evil, and Michael J. Fox in an early role. In Class of 1984, Andy Norris, um, who was also in Slaughterhouse-Five and played by Perry King, um, an, ide an idealistic and naive music teacher is who has moved into the Lincoln High community with his pregnant wife, Diane. Appalled by the crime-infested school, Norse soon crosses sabers with its teenage kingpin, the shrewd and sadistic Peter Stegman, uh, the White Shadows' Timothy Van Patten. While Norris, uh, with Norris setting his sights on reforming Stegman, the young miscreant declares war on his teacher, and the duo set sets a fateful showdown into motion on the night of an important school orchestra performance. Um, stunning film, um, one that I am not ashamed to admit that I had not seen up until this point. And many people may argue the fact, oh, is, is this a horror film? I would not call this a straight-out, up-and-up horror film. However, there are certainly some terribly horrific elements to this film. I definitely feel, feel like the film is a cult classic and is a film that, uh, you know, a lot of people need to check out. You know, as as I had mentioned in the beginning, um, 
you know, Andy Norris, the teacher, and his wife uh, moved to the school. And on his first day of school, he goes in and <clears throat> he actually meets. Um, I'm trying to get all my names right here. Andy McDowell's character, who is a biology teacher in the school. And, you know, he seems, uh, Andy seems a little surprised by the police and the metal detectors and, and things like that. He goes into his class, and there's um, a, a, a group of kids, you know, very much in that, uh, having that punk style look. And they're pretty disruptive during the class, and Norris kicks them out. You know, so that's kind of the first cross. And as you see, as time goes on, you know, these guys are, are dealing drugs, prostitution, gang violence, things like that. And as the film goes on, uh, Andy runs into them in the bathroom uh, selling drugs to one of his students, and the student eventually winds up committing suicide. Michael J. Fox's character uh, is the friend of the guy who kills himself, and He's afraid to say anything, but he winds up being knifed in a cafeteria fight because the gang thinks that he's he's snitching on them. They wind up putting him in the hospital. When Andy confronts them about it, um, Stegman brutalizes himself in the bathroom, smashing his head against a mirror, against the wall, busting his face up making it look like Norris attacks him. And things keep going back and forth. Um, the gang blows up his car, uh, graffiti. They even go so far as to murder the animals of the biology teacher, setting him off. And in a later sequence, he holds the class at gunpoint, even uh, almost shooting Stegman until Norris intervenes. Things go on, you know, fighting animosity between everyone, and McDowell's character winds up trying to run over Stegman and winds up dying in a car crash. So Norris is trying is a music teacher and he's trying to get uh, his students to to do this musical number. Uh, you know, to try and give them recognition for the work that they do. And the night of the event, Stegman and his cohorts break into Norris's house and gang rape his wife and take her hostage and show up at the school. Right before the performance, the young lady of the group has a picture sent up to Stegman and he, or uh, to Norris, and he chases after them, and they wind up brutalizing him in the school. He winds up escaping, and they search through the school to find him and shut him up. And through various encounters, he winds up offing the different members of the group in self-defense. In particular, one scene that, that I found really uh, powerful was uh, there's a table saw, and he winds up sawing off a guy's arm and throwing him on it and killing him. Another one of the gang members is horrifically burned in the shop um another two uh one of them norris has to beat down in the head with a uh steel pipe the young female of the group tries to run him over with a car and winds up hitting a support and knocking another car on top of her pinning her in the car at that point she gives up where his wife is and she's with stegman on the roof one of his students winds up conducting uh, the class while all of this is going on. And right at the end of the performance, uh, Norris and Stegman run into each other on the roof. And as they're fighting, Norris punches Stegman, and Stegman falls through a glass roof. And he's holding on by ropes. Norris tries to save him, and Stegman tries to stab him. Norris punches him in the face, and he falls through the glass ceiling through another ceiling and a rope gets caught around, and he winds up being hung and killed in front of the students and the parents who are there for the concert. Andy is never charged with any of the uh, the murders since there are no witnesses to what happened. 
one of the things that I find really fascinating about this film is even way back in 1982, you know, the director finds a way to show where public schools were going at that time. And while things are not quite as violent as they are in the film, there are certainly terrible things like this that happen in schools and still happen to this day. The bonus features on this disc are absolutely incredible. There's the new high-definition transfer of the film from the introspective. Uh, the new interviews with director Mark Lester, composer Lalo Schifrin, actors Perry King, Lisa Langelies, and Aaron Noble. There's a new career retrospective interview with Perry King that I thought was really fascinating, and he talks about a wide variety of films that he worked on. There's audio commentary with director Mark Lester. The feature at Blood, uh, Blood and Blackboards, which has interviews with Lester King and uh, actress uh, Mary Lynn Ross, were quite insightful and, and gives you a, a nice perspective on you know, what was going on with the film, the times. Even the, uh, the actress who plays um, Perry King's wife talks about, you know, the rape sequence, how terrifying that was, you know, even though she wasn't physically hurt, it was, you know, a very traumatic experience filming that. There's a nice poster in Still Gallery, and there's the theatrical trailers and TV spots. Um, again, one of the one of the more amazing discs put out by Scream Factory, I would definitely give this disc as an overall a 9 out of 10. I love the artwork and the alternate artwork, the flip cover art that come with this, I think you you can't go wrong either way, depending on, on which version of the artwork you want to use. I do think it's a very grim social social commentary, but I think it's one that people today would look at and look back on it and see this film as a cult classic. Overall, I would give the film rating a three and a half out of five stars. Again, very capably acted. There are going to be actors that you recognize all throughout this. I mean, seeing uh, Andy McDowell in the film, or excuse me, Roddy McDowell, uh, fascinating to see him in that role. And, you know, the sadness of his character in particular, why he, you know, he's just so sad that he can't get any of the students he feels to respond to him trying to teach. So definitely head on over to ShoutFactory.com to pick up your Blu-ray edition, collector's edition of Class of 1984. Um, again, there's there's just so much to check out on this. You should be able to head to your local big box retailer on April 14th and pick this up. You should be able to go on Amazon.com and pick up a copy as well. It's been a hell of an evening. I want to say thank you so much to our feature guest this evening, Fred Vogel of Toe Tag Pictures. Very informative interview. Make sure to head on over to Toe Tag's website and pick up copies of his films. You will not be disappointed. I want to say thank you to our friends at Metal Blade Records for sending us Apophis's Prime Incursion. I enjoyed the metal, and I think all of the fans did too. Thank you to our friends at Scream Factory for sending us our copy of Class of 1984 for review. And thank you to our friends at Olive Films for sending us our Blu-ray copy of Night of the Scarecrow. Make sure to keep an eye on HorrorSociety.com for the reviews of those. Once again, I want to say you know, terrible with the news of Robert Zadar passing at the beginning of the show. Condolences go out to his family. We here at Horror Society and at Living Dead Magazine wish his family the best. Until next week, ladies and gentlemen, this is the dead man, Michael Jones, from HorrorSociety.com and Living Dead Magazine, telling you all to rest in peace.